All right, good afternoon, everybody. How y'all doing? Good. Thank you for spending your afternoon with us. I know it's May the 4th, and there's a giant Star Wars marathon on TBS, so thank you for being here. Um, so we're going to have a group discussion uh, for about 45 minutes, and then we'll open it up to Q&A, and then each of our speakers is going to close us out with a personal anecdote to uh, motivate you to take climate action upon leaving the room. So we're going to start with uh, Bill, uh, who has a new book out called Falter, one of several that he's written. Um, and just to set some context uh, for the day, Bill, a lot of your uh, book is a, this concern that the, the human game is playing itself out. Curious for you, is human game the human race? Are we talking about extinction? Are we talking about societal collapse? We're in a building full of dinosaur bones. Are we, is that the path that we're on? Well, we're definitely in big trouble. Um, you know, this, this new book is the 30-year follow-on, 30 years to the year after I wrote The End of Nature, which was the first book about climate change for a general audience. At that time, we knew we were in trouble. We understood enough about the molecular structure of CO2 to know what was going to happen, but we didn't know how fast or how hard. The story of the last 30 years is it come faster and harder than we expected. Um, and now we're in a world of hurt. We've uh, increased the temperature of the planet one degree Celsius, almost two degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, that's been enough to melt 70% of the summer sea ice in the Arctic. The ocean is 30% more acidic. We're seeing uh, unbelievable effects already as we throw things out of kilter. Sometimes those are in places where we have lots of cameras. So everyone got to watch last year while uh, city in California, literally called paradise, literally turned into hell inside half an hour. Most of them, of course, are in places with fewer cameras. The iron law of climate change is the less you did to cause it, the more you suffer from it. So, you know, today in Mozambique and Southeast Africa, people are somehow trying to recover from the second, second record cyclone in the last month. This latest one dropped six and a half feet of water on parts of Mozambique. Um, you know, the Indian government the night before last tried to evacuate 11 million people from the path of the cyclone hitting uh, along the Bay of Bengal. Um, so we're, and having raised the temperature one degree, we're on a path to raise it about three and a half degrees, even if we kept the promises that we'd made at the Paris Climate Accords which of course at least one country has decided not to keep. So um, um, that's the bad news. The good news in this race, and it is a race, is that movements are stepping up and showing up and we can see it more and more all the time. Um, you know, in, in, uh, in this country, uh, we've watched in the last few months as the Senate, uh, Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez and the young people of the Sunrise Movement have started this Green New Deal idea floating around and it's garnered significant traction. Uh, when they polled Democratic voters last week, they found that climate change was the number one issue motivating them as they went to the polls. In London, this group Extinction Rebellion has tied down the Capitol with just standing in the street for a couple of weeks. By the end of it, the parliament in the UK, led by the conservative government there, had uh, passed a climate emergency resolution, the, the first in the world. Uh, you've all seen around the world the remarkable scenes as small children walk out of school on school strike led by uh, uh, Greta Thunberg in Sweden. Um, so the opposition, the, the kind of rest of us, led usually by indigenous communities and by communities on the front line of change are rallying to build a movement. We don't know whether we got it started fast enough or not. I mean, the, the bottom line is that that climate change is the first time test we ever had. Dr. King, who was my particular hero, used to end every speech by saying, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Uh, this may take a while, but we're going to win. In our case, in this case, that's not true. 
The arc of the physical universe is short and it bends toward heat. And if we do not win quickly, we won't win at all, which is why the organizing now seems so urgent. And I'll, maybe we'll talk a little later about next steps and what we're gonna need everybody to do coming up soon. Thanks, Bill. Um, Cheryl, for those uh, in, in the room, I think in the introduction, the, the, your, your mother and her legacy were referenced. Your, your family name is the first name uh, in frontline community organizing around environmental issues here in Chicago. I think the, the phrase environmental justice is used a lot. Uh, I think it's one of those things that's easy to say and harder to really wrap your head around what it means as a value proposition, as a process, as an outcome. Just for everyone here, t tell us what that legacy of environmental justice is and what it even means. Oh, that's a loaded question there. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let me, de personally, what I define environmental uh, justice for me is the unequal treatment of community of color. It also is inclusive of the, un the unequal protection of community just for profit gain or our own personal consumerism. My community has 50 documented landfill, and I get praise to my mom. Her name is Hazel Johnson. She's very known nationally and internationally as the mother of environmental justice because she worked for nearly 25 years to get an understanding of what was going on in my neighborhood. I'm a, my community was built in 1944. It's public houses, one of the four developments that was built in the city of Chicago for the returning veterans um, from World War II, particularly African-American community. We moved out there in 1962, and the history of that area has been a contaminated community since the 1880s. My mother heard that the south side of Chicago have the higher incidence of cancer than any other area within the city of Chicago, and she wanted to know why. Because my father, it's interesting, my father died, it would be 50 years this coming June. She founded the organization 10 years after his death, so our organization would be 40 years old this coming June. And she wants to know why my community had a high incidence of cancer than any other area what. So she did her own personal research. My mother's a widow of seven children. My father died when I was eight. Um, and so my mother took it on herself to do her own personal research. And she found out we have 50 documented landfills in our area, 250 leaking underground storage tanks, and over 350 hazardous waste, uh, hazardous waste sites around our community. So she labeled our community the toxic donut because within the center of the donut is where community and outside the parameters was the, all these pollutant entities. And she just felt that it was not humanly right for some community to be in an area, a, a residential area, in, a, in the industrial zone. So she started educating the community. And what she, what she learned that because of institutional systemic racism is the interconnected to the environmental injustices that we were experiencing in our community. It's the fact that I, I, we, we don't have a grocery store, the business district that we used to own and operate, no, banks wouldn't loan to us. So when you just can't look at environmental justice as a single entity, you have to look at, and in my community, we have multimedia exposure, air, water, and land. We got 19 miles of waterway, 11 miles is unfit for human consumption and recreation, but my community continues to fish out the same rivers and lakes. Our land was built on a liquid dump site back in the 1880 run by the George Employment Farm. So when you think about all the industries and the emissions from the smokestack from these facilities, and they was built to blow in the southwest corner of the south side, is the directly area where my community sits. So the only Concern, when I look at environmental justice, you have to look at 
the apolitical structure in my community. We're not, we're not voting like we should. We are not engaged in the political process. We're not even educated about the political process for our community. We don't know about the, the right to know about the operation of facilities. They in, in these facilities is in compliances with they, with they permits to operate in our community. You know, because it was at one point, we had 350,000 pounds of pollutants in our air every single day. Today is a little less than 100,000 pounds uh, of pollutants every day. That's still too much. Because what impact my community, it just doesn't stay there, y'all, right? And pollution don't go to heaven. So whatever goes up must come down. We all impacted by it, but, but we have to look at, one of the things I love about the environmental movement today, we see our commonality, we understand our commonality, because everybody want to drink, say, clean water. That's a given fact. Everybody want to breathe clean air. That's a given fact. And nobody wants to live on contaminate, contaminated soil where our kids is the one that who enjoy the most. And we don't want to go to an industry not knowing if we ever not going to come back because something happened by human nature, human fault, because we tried to cut corners, because we don't want to pay this, or we don't want to dispose this. So that's when I look at it, is the unfair equal environment protection for people like community of color. See, a lot of people can pay the taxes. What good is you paying the taxes when you're still at, in, uh, indirectly impacting the whole society because it just doesn't stay there. The mitigation from the different weather pattern, you know, so it's just real interesting for me to say that I do these kind of speaking because I want to hit you where it hit me in my heart and my soul every day. Sometimes I can wake up to clean it, breathing decent air, then some, the majority of the time I don't. So, but one of the things that we, we are responsible for it, and we got to come together and sometimes we got to recycle our souls, our way that we're thinking about people because I'm not a person, I choose to live in all Gale Gardens. I've been living out there for 57 years because I choose to. I am well educated and I could have lived somewhere else, but I'm staying to help revitalize the community that I love and trust and I've been living all my life. And nothing should be wrong about, okay, it's public housing, subsidized housing. I don't care about wealth. I care about the quality of life, the environmental quality that we all should equally, as human beings, should be entitled to. Thanks, Sheriff. <laughs> uh, Stephanie, this is the Humanities Festival, and you have the distinct pleasure of working in the humanities. You're in a ha handful of folks who specializes in environmental humanities, another term that on surface value, someone might be able to figure out what it is, but it means a lot more. Tell, what is environmental humanities and how does it co connect back to the themes of justice that Cheryl was just? Great, thank you for the question. And I also just wanna say what an honor it is to be sitting on stage with you, Cheryl, and with you, Bill. It's a real honor. Um, uh, you know, the environmental humanities came into being in part by student demand. I've worked in public universities all my life I primarily work with what we would call middle class students, although that term is a little more fragile than it used to be. My students, for the most part, are sensitive people. They're empathic people. They don't want to live in a racist world. They don't want to live in a world where they have no future because it seems like the planet that survived and with them and kind of created conditions where they're thriving is, is going away. And so I see students every day with mental health problems, with high anxiety. Right now I have 20 students reporting anxiety, having problems coming to class because of that. And these are really smart, great individuals with a lot of hope, but no place to put it. So let me bring myself back to the environmental humanities as a field. This is a field that is interdisciplinary, it's philosophy, it's religious studies, it's language studies, it's, it's literary, uh, it is history. And we take all those humanities disciplines and we say there's no way that we can imagine being human without an environment to support 
our species, our culture, our way of life, and a notion of justice that has not yet been realized in this country or elsewhere. Um, and I would say that the kind of work that Ms. Johnson and her mother have done, the kind of work that Bill McKibben has done, work for environmental justice and social justice more broadly is absolutely the center of any environmental humanities agenda. And I feel like what we're doing in the classroom, and I teach about 500 students a year, is we're trying to create spaces where students can envision and develop through you know, ethical philosophy, through sometimes fiction writing exercises about the kind of society they want to live in, uh, through understanding our histories, histories of environmental justice, histories of environmental movements throughout the world. Students are trying to develop that climate democracy that we want to come into being and that we do not yet have. But we want it to be there culturally for our young people so that it can, we can all be ready, we can all answer the call. Whenever the call comes, and the call has already come in many forms, it'll come again. So I think that's really where we see ourselves in the environmental humanities, just really being there to remind everybody that any humanities exercise that we participate in, as philosophers, as historians, as literary scholars, also involves reminding ourselves that as a human species, we co-make our worlds with a lot of other forms of life. And the way that things have gone down, the kinds of power structures that have been allowed to flourish uh, in this country and elsewhere have put all those forms of life at stake, and therefore our own species at stake in profound ways. And, you know, I, like I said, I'm here to respond to student demand. This field that came into being came into being in large part because our students were saying we're not quite getting the education we need to live up to our activism and live up to also our profound fear of what it might mean to live in a climate change future. And of course, that future is now. That future is now. Thank you very much. Um, as, as I was uh, preparing for this this morning and thinking about the premise uh, from Bill's book of the, the human game, uh, for me, a game includes teams. Uh, and so I was trying in my own head to, to map out who the teams are on the field. Uh, and I think I've boiled it down to four, and I'm hoping we can talk about them today. The first would be folks who are actually doing something, so cl climate activists, and they can take many shapes and sizes and forms and come from the most powerful halls uh, to folks who are disproportionately affected uh, by climate change but have, in theory, the least amount of power. But they're the ones who are doing something, and we'll talk about them later. In my mind, there's three other teams. Uh, there's the team who writes their own climate fiction and, and lives in an alternate reality where all of these things are happening and they pretend not to see it. Um, and we're gonna talk about uh, that particular mode of climate fiction. Mm -hmm. There are folks for whom there are lots of other pressing concerns on a daily basis, uh, whether that's employment or health or the, the landfill that's across the street and for cl climate change is this massive global thing that can be difficult to grapple with, particularly if on a day-to-day -day basis, you just have to do something else. And then I was struggling to come up with a, the, a, some way to categorize the, the fourth team. Um, and I was, I was at the uh, park building uh, with my kids at gymnastics and someone walked in and they solved the problem for me. They had a shirt on that just said, I can't adult today. I can't adult today. And in my mind, that team, of the folks that just can't adult today is the other team on the field here when it comes to climate action. And so I'm gonna hope that each of the three of you can describe a little bit um, your work with one of these three teams. And so Stephanie, uh, I know you've been doing some work with folks who are disproportionately affected by climate change, but just ch choose not to see that as the truth of, of what they live in. And how do you move forward with a group like that uh, toward a positive result. Tell, tell us about your work there. Great, thank you. Um, well, I, I would phrase what, I would rephrase your question a little bit, but let me tell you about the work first. So I'm involved right now in a project gathering oral histories all over Oregon about the public lands. And the book project that'll come out of this is called To Speak of Common Futures, the history uh, and the future of Oregon's public lands. Oregon is a very divided state. We have some of the most absolutely extreme liberalism on earth in the state of Oregon. We also have 
very, very, very conservative folks in Oregon. So, we, and we have many, we have nine federally recognized tribal nations and a great deal of indigenous activism around climate. So it's a really interesting place to talk with people about what we mean by public lands, who publics are, how do we co-manage a land that has histories of colonialism, colonial violence, racism, uh, and all kinds of you know, complications uh, built into it. How do we become an American public? And I really think this project for me has been all about how do we make democracy work in a country where democracy is so broken and so deeply connected to ecological systems which are also broken and suffering. Um, and the, some of the folks that we talk to are ranchers and farmers typically who do not want to use the word climate change. Now they're not deniers, and that's the, that's the interesting little distinction. These people believe in it. They are even a little bit worried that maybe they, there, there's some sort of guilt and anxiety about maybe they caused it, humans caused it more broadly, but they don't want to use words that they see connected to liberal elites or to scientists who are working in federal institutions, federal agencies like the BLM or the Forest Service who might want to come in and disrespect their own local knowledge or traditional knowledge and try to impose things on them that they don't think are going to work on those lands. So the real questions that we're grappling with are how do we try to build trust uh, amongst constituencies that have been so profoundly divided in this country, often by media. I mean, the AM radio, you know, I mean, there's, there's a lot going on on AM radio and elsewhere to make people in rural uh, communities feel as if they're being mocked, uh, denigrated, considered, you know, stupid, when in fact they do have a lot of knowledge. Um, so it's been a real, I think, test of our own abilities as academics to go into situations, remove all of the stripping of whatever an academic persona might look like, a pointy-headed intellectual or, or, you know, an elite, and, and really try to listen to these folks and try to get a sense of where their knowledge is coming from and what kind of data around climate and adaptation actually are going to be useful to them, what they want, who could give it to them in a way that is going to feel comfortable and not laden with various kinds of ideological overtones that, they, that immediately trigger distrust. Um, we have a young woman um, named Lena Iwama, who is a biology student, wants to be a range conservation scientist, who's right now trying to develop grasses that are going to be more resilient in eastern Oregon as drought conditions become more and more severe there. And she's going in and just talking to people and kind of trying to become part of communities and show that she's there to help. Um, and I think those kinds of projects are really important. Can we scale them up? I don't know but I still think we have to do them. So, you know, what I see isn't people who are, who look like the kind of Twitter landscape that I think repulses so many of us. I don't see people who are dying to answer the call of the white nation, which horrifies me and which has become so much a part of our current regime. I see people who are trying to struggle to make a farm work and who feel disenfranchised and who feel like their education might not be respected, their experience might not be respected, but they know what's going on. They work the land. And they're scared. They're already on academic uh, sort of skids. How do they make it work? Um, is there a common language that we can start to use to move forward as a community? That's a big question. Thank you. Cheryl, I, I have had the privilege of working with you a tiny bit and hope to work with you more. Some of what she just described sounds Sounds a little bit like what I know to be of uh, reality at Allkeld and in the South Side more broadly. For you and the work that you do, your neighbors, your stakeholders, wh where does climate change fit in, if at all, with day-to-day -day challenges, the reality of other environmental issues? Like, how, how does it factor into the work that you do, or, or, or does it? And is climate survival, it's the name of the panel, is climate survival a thing, or is survival the thing? Well, you could really consider both. Yep. Um, it's the way, it's all about communication. When you live in a community that doesn't have not one community paper to learn about what is climate issues or any other issues that, or any other politics that goes on in your community, it becomes a challenge. But if you learn through my experience of working with this organization, to connect it personally so they do get an understanding about 
what is the climate related issues in our community. Um, it gives people the, uh, the concern to be more engaged, to start having the conversation. But when you're limited on the resources to reach the mass of 6,000 people in your community, it becomes, a, that's a huge challenge for our organization. But we believe that if we educate one particular person, then we are succeeding. You know, we may can't do it in the, in the, in the mass of how many people we want to show them, but th let's take an example. For, in our community, our organization will be responsible for the eradication of lead-based pain and asbestos from throughout all public housing because we had a high level in our community, but we advocated for it to be removed in all public housing. But we also turned that into an educational and an economic opportunity for our community because we offered training as residential lead abatement workers in the community. And from the, training them and then we was able to interject with some of the issues that really that is around our community, how we have to take a personal a stand to make a change in that. And then we're connected to many of the contractors who was doing the removable for the Chicago Housing Authority. So to say that um, this issue is personal for us, and if we connect it to the, even the health-related issues in our community, when they can tell when there's an elevation of their kids going, to, going back and forth to the hospital because they, they have asthmatic episodes, and they're connected to what the wind is because we are doing air monitoring in our community. So it gives people that tangible data that was not available from, um, from the beginning. And now it's just that the political processes that we need to know how to bring resolutions for, to our community, you know, because a lot of people is in denial or just to feel that because we're public housing that we don't have the political will to make those changes, but we, we are committed for those changes to happen in our community, but it's just not just my communities. When it was affect my community, it affects everybody's community. You know, so we have to learn how to work this together because the only way we're gonna resolve this issue is if we work together. Um, one thing I always admire, uh, I understand why my mother used to call my, my area open environmental lab. It just need government, academic, community, and business to come together to create what we call an environmental remediation workforce so that we can revitalize a lot of the land and water and the air contamination that we experience on a daily basis. But it takes the will of the people to make that happen. But the challenge that we have is that because we're in the community, we're indoctrinated with it every day, and getting the community to become more engaged and be part of these conversations and these movements is when you don't, when you have limited resources to make that happen. But um, I'm committed. I ain't going nowhere, y'all. I'm staying there. <laughs> so, and I hope that, and every day we are engaging more people into uh, the programs that we are doing. I went from having three staff, I now have 16. So we're growing, you know, but we're talking about empowerment to make a systemic change in our community. But you have to understand what those systemic issues are in your community. And it's all directly towards our environment. Yeah. Um, Bill, this, this other team, this team with a uniform that says, I can't adult today, uh, in my mind is the biggest team uh, on the field. Uh, the folks who are just opting out of uh, solutions, opting out of taking it seriously, opting out uh, of responsibility for what we see happening around us. Your organization, the folks that you work with, how do you get that team mobilized to do something? How do you wake them up so, and get them to change uniforms? So first of all, let's remember that there's another team on the field too. Let's call them Team Exxon, the fossil fuel industry that spent 30 years uh, systematically poisoning the well of public information to make sure that people are confused, apathetic, whatever else. And we take them on hard. We get in the way when they're trying to build pipelines. We divest now at this point $8 trillion worth of endowments and portfolios. And it would be, it'd be awful good 
if the Field Museum and other institutions in Chicago joined with all the museums and things around the world that have decided they don't want to be directly linked up to the fossil fuel industry anymore. So the job, of course, you're right, is to get as many people engaged in a fight as you can. Um, and and we need, that's what we need. I mean, you know, 19, we're coming up on the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. 1970, the first Earth Day, there were 20 million Americans in the streets. That was one in 10 of the then population. That turns out to be enough. Um, you know, for the next four years, there's a couple other people in here old enough like me to remember Richard Nixon. Uh, Richard Nixon had not an environmental bone in his body, but he signed every important piece of legislation on which we still depend because people gave him no choice. They had changed the zeitgeist. We need that to happen again. It is starting to happen. Uh, uh, that's what the kind of uprisings around everything from the Keystone Pipeline and Standing Rock to whatever look like, but we need it to happen in a bigger way. Keep your eyes peeled. In the fall, you've been watching young people do these climate strikes from school. We need everybody doing that. And there's going to be a day or two of just everybody that can, everybody who doesn't absolutely need that day's wages, everybody who won't get fired if they take part. People with that kind of privilege, we need them out stopping business as usual because literally it is business as usual that is doing us in. It's the fact that we all get up day after day and do more or less what we did the day before, even in the middle of the worst thing that ever unfolded, unfolding around us. That's the problem. It's also worth noting that uh, there's something mildly undignified about letting 12-year-olds carry most of the weight, you know, in this <laughs> fight, it must be said. Now, I'll tell you who I'm not worried about getting on board in that fight, and it's communities of color in this country. Uh, African Americans and Latino Americans poll far higher in their belief in and concern about climate change than anybody else in our society. I mean, truth be told, the, I mean, 60% of white Americans voted for Donald Trump. That's where the, you know, that's where the problem lies. So we've got to figure out how to make that. When, when activists work on this kind of huge problem, the thing we work for is less particular pieces of legislation, I think, than it is changing the zeitgeist changing people's sense of what's normal and natural and obvious, what's going to come next. Um, and we can do this. The question, and the, it's a haunting question, is whether we can do it in time or not. And I, the, the truthful answer is no one knows. It's just coming so fast now that we have to work. F I mean, we're, we're, we're in a climate moment right now if we waste this particular climate moment, odds are we're not going to get another one in the relevant time frame. So uh, it feels very, very urgent to me right now. So some of what all of you are describing uh, and the theme here is power. Uh, has to do with disproportionate power of the few, the team Exxon, the elected officials, and let's be honest, the, the white men uh, that are out there, the disproportionate power of them to do something, and they have a choice to do the right thing or to do the wrong thing, and then the disproportionate effects of climate change felt by everyone else who typically do not have the resources, do not have the wealth, do not, they're not in charge of the power structures. That's why we are where we are. The transformation that you're describing seems to necessitate uh, building wealth and building power amongst communities uh, that historically haven't had it. And so I'm curious to know from, from everyone here, uh, examples, stories, work that you're doing for transformation that intentionally builds community wealth. And Cheryl, you were describing the work that you're doing on, on solar training and, and building a solar workforce. And maybe that's a good place to start because it is transformation while attempting to build community wealth. So. Yes, um, for the past four years, our organization's been working, our organization's been really working on um, how do we engage our community in renewable energy opportunity for our community? 
we became part of the Illinois Climate Table who was having these discussions and also was taking the lead to produce legislation on a state level to get the commitment from um, our legislature, legislators. And fortunately, 2017, December 2017, we signed, uh, our, leg our state legislature signed the Future Energy Job Act. And under the Future Energy Job Act, there comes the Solar for All program. And the Solar for All program distinctly dis um, target low-income community and environmental justice community to have the opportunity in the solar energy opp uh, uh, opportunity that can come to our community. So when that meeting start happening, I start having a conversation with the leadership of the Chicago Housing Authority saying, why don't you make all Gale Gardens because we have the most available land in any of the, the area because we, we, at the, we at the end line of the city of Chicago. We're, we're annexed, we're close to the village of Dalton and the village of Riverdale. But we had the last of the city line, so we, and we're close to a, a, a forest preserve in our area. So I said, and the little Calumet River in our area will give opportunity. And we used to have 1,998 units in our community. And we have less than 1,600 now because they demolished a lot of the units. So we said, why don't we take that space um, and used to create a solar array system in our area because our community particularly only uses three megawatts of energy. And we're proposing to create 10 megawatts for our community where we can share with the adjacent community. And whatever we, whatever we uh, left out of that, we would use that energy and, and sell back to ComEd so we could create programs and create businesses, youth, not only for the adult, but youth businesses in the community to become a sustainable community, use that as a economic energy to start looking to make our community sustainable in our community. So um, CHA hired us to develop that curriculum. We, are, we should be completed by the end end of June, and we're gonna implement this curriculum for our community, and we hope to be, we're going to be part of the, the development for the solar array system in our community. Bill, you're most active on the, on the global sphere of, of any of the four of us up here. What are, transformation that is building wealth amongst the disproportionately affected? Well, what's going on? I mean, what do you see? First of all, it's really important to remember that, you know, in the same way, in the sort of same way that the city of Chicago stands in relation to Alt Gelsman, that's how, say, the United States stands in relation to Bangladesh, and, you know, a thousand, uh, you know, all the kind of poorest parts of the world that are taking the hit without having caused almost any of the problem from climate change. So it's really good to see some places beginning now to, uh, 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 to reap the benefits of this renewable energy revolution. Uh, in the book, I talk a lot about being in uh, various, I spent a lot of time in various parts of Africa where there's never been power and there was never, I mean, it's as if fossil fuel might as well never been discovered because no one was ever gonna build the grid out to these places. There's a billion people on the planet without power at the moment. Um, and, and now they're getting it fast in a lot of places because the price of a solar panel has dropped so far that it's become suddenly quickly economic to do it. So I remember being, to give you an example, uh, with a, um, a wonderful African-American woman entrepreneur named Nicole Poindexter who set up a company first in Ghana called Black Star Energy. We were out deep in the, uh, deep in the hinterlands in Ghana, right on the equator, in a community where the week before they'd set up a solar microgrid, 40 panels, and wired it into the, you know, the 40 or 50 huts in this community. And I, I, you know, first we met the doctor who'd been delivering babies for years with, at best, a kind of flashlight clenched between his teeth. Now he had a refrigerator to store vaccine, you know. I was sitting around with the old men, the elders of this community, and it was very hot because it's always very hot in Ghana. And 
they kept handing me bottles of cold water to drink, for which I was grateful, but it took me 15 minutes in my clueless suburban way to figure out why they were so proud. I mean, until the week before, when this microsolar array went in, there'd never been anything cold in that community ever. Like, cold was a new idea, you know? And when you look at it that way, you suddenly realize that this solar panel is, a, you know, this is, you know, I mean, I'm a Methodist Sunday school teacher, but this is water into wine, you know? This is uh, Hogwarts scale magic. You point a sheet of glass at the sun, and out the back comes you know, light and cold and information and modernity. I mean, that's the most amazing thing of our time. And if we had any brains at all, it's what we'd be doing as a civilization with the 21st century is pushing sun and wind out to every corner of the planet just as fast as we possibly could. It really is beautiful to see those communities, people starting to acquire just a little bit of, uh, of uh, I mean, th this woman, uh, Nicole Poindexter, was pointing out that these are cacao-growing communities for the most part. And she just brought back a chocolate bar from the airport in Amsterdam where she'd been, and she'd paid $16 for a pound of chocolate. She said, I th by my back-of-the-envelope calculations, two cents of that $16 went to the farmers here growing the cacao. With a little bit of electricity, they're able to move at least one step up the supply chain uh, and process the nuts far enough that they can get 30 or 40 cents a pound, which is still being ripped off in a serious way. But on the other hand, um, it's a serious stride forward in just the ways you're describing. Great. Uh, for the crowd working the, the uh, mics after Stephanie's done here, I'm going to start with some of the audience Q&A if our team wants to get up with the mics. So Stephanie, these themes of restoration, of transformation, of empowering the unempowered, how do those play out in the, in the literature uh, within the environmental humanities movement? Who are the writers? Who, who, what are the stories being told, fiction or nonfiction, uh, that, that we should be paying attention to? Sure, thank you. I'll, I'll mention a few by published authors that many of you may know, and then I'll mention a few by my students. So I think the work of the amazing speculative fiction author Octavia Butler is at the front and center of my own interest in fictions about getting through the socio-ecological nightmare that we find ourselves within. Um, Parable of the Sower, Parable of Talents, two books in a series that Butler actually unfortunately died before she was able to finish that series, give us uh, a president whose slogan is Make America Great Again, she was a prophet, <laughs> and a community of people who have been, uh, you know, who've survived racism in LA, who've survived various kinds of social disenfranchisement, working their way up the now defunct highway system of California to try to establish some kind of collaborative, multi-ethnic, multi-racial community. The community doesn't end up quite like they hoped. This president, with his slogan, has a little bit more troops on the ground than everybody was anticipating. But what Butler really gets at, again, is how racism, systemic racism, social justice issues, problems of unequal distribution of power are at the core of why we find ourselves where we are in this moment with climate change. This is all interrelated, and she beautifully makes those connections for us. So if you're going to read one work of what we could loosely call climate fiction, I would, I would point to Parable of the Sower. Parable of the Talents is also a terrific book by Butler. Um, and some of these books helps up, has up, help us envision possible futures, even if the future doesn't arrive in the novel itself. It's gestured toward, and we can see, again, all the socio-historical factors that led to the problem, a problem that looks very similar to our own, a little bit more amped up in terms of disaster, but similar. You know, you start to understand those socio-historical processes, and I think solutions and transformation become easier to envision. They become possible. Fiction teaches us that no future is inevitable. Every work of fiction is a possible world that does not exist or does not yet exist, but that could, in some respect, be brought into being. We do collaborative fictions with our students 
Um, students are one of the biggest disenfranchised groups in this moment because it's their future again that has been absolutely stolen from them by kleptocrats. We're living with kleptocracy in this moment in a profound way. Exxon, yes, is on the stage. So, for instance, I have a game designer named Ken Eklund who I work with. He's created a collaborative storytelling game called Abundant Futures, which our students play through their cell phones. It causes, the, the, the game leads them around our campus in Eugene and around the city of Eugene and asks them to think about alternative futures, different technologies, solar, wind, renewables, but also different social futures. There's a monument in our town to all those who were interned, the Japanese who were interned during World War II. Let's think about what that meant. Let's think about what that means now in the current atmosphere in terms of how immigrants and immigration are being discussed and the kinds of policies that are being implemented by our federal government. Let's think about how that wounds us. The climate of the culture participates in the physics of climate change in a variety of ways. When our students do these kinds of collaborative storytelling games, one of the implicit messages is you have the agency to participate in your own future, no matter who might try to tell you that you do not. You do. And they're smart people. They're already involved in some of the most interesting activism that's going around around climate, as Bill and others have said. But I think storytelling, fictionalizing, and even thinking about utopias are, this is this kind of gives people fuel for the fight. You need to have these places of refuge where you can think a world into being that is not yet with you, but that you want to be your world. You need that refuge of art and of fiction. Thank you. So we have time, and I'm sure there are folks in the audience that have questions. In theory, there are microphones, and I am scanning the room for people with, wait, there we go, there's one. So, uh, folks uh, with questions for any of our speakers, and then uh, after that, we'll move on to the next piece. We have a very shy audience. All right, here we go, gentlemen. And just uh, do us a favor, introduce yourselves, and, and why, why did you come today, and then ask your question. <clears throat> My name is Sam Williamson, and I'm a retired economic historian. Um, I have a question for Bill. Um, it, it was interesting that India was able to move a million people in a day at regard to this uh, flood, or I mean the, the cyclone. <clears throat> when I was on Earth Day, the same thing. The population of the world was like four billion and now it's approaching eight billion. The other thing about the difference between those two periods is that uh, urbanization was about 40% and now it's about 55%. So people have moved to cities and the population has grown tremendously. <clears throat> We in Chicago live next to the largest body of fresh water in the world that's clean. Uh, and you know, we, we don't think about that as much when you talked about the ocean going and so forth. There are 21 million people in Florida. When Florida goes under the water, why, where will those 21 million people go? Are they gonna come up here to the Great Lakes? And, and this, this speaks a lot to this difference between wealth because people who have wealth can move. People who can't, they're going to be stuck. And this is true all over the world. <clears throat> so 50 years from now, my grandchildren, are they going to see a world that maybe is only 4 billion people because they've adjusted to this? And do we have dikes on cities uh, that are on the ocean and are a lot more people living here? Because the Tribune is always worried about people leaving Illinois. I think they're all going to come back. <laughs> Yeah. Thanks very much. Well, well, you can't complain because how many Illinoisans went to Florida down there? You know, um, um, the um, um, the the world in this century is going to be marked by people in motion, um, and that's going to be an enormous difficulty. You've watched, say, the fact that a, a, a record drought in Syria forced a million farmers off their land and into the cities and was one of, if not the main trigger for the Civil War that in turn spun a million refugees out into Western Europe and discombobulated the politics of that continent. The pretty gripping drought in the highlands of Honduras and Guatemala has clearly driven a lot of the migration to our southern border 
uh, uh, discombobulating our politics in serious ways. Um, now imagine those reach about a million people. Imagine that the low end for the UN estimate for climate refugees by the middle to latter part of the century is 200 million, and the high end is a billion. Um, try to imagine what kind of chaos is unleashed in the world. I mean, yeah, we're going to have to figure out, not a, I mean, yes, people are going to figure out dikes and cities and things, but what we're going to have to figure out is how to generously and compassionately allow lots of people to move and retreat from places that are uh, indefensible. Um, um, the opposite of building walls would be the correct you know, response here. Um, 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 but we also have to figure out how to slow down that process as much as we can. That's why it is so, I mean, what we do over the next five or 10 years in terms of cutting emissions will determine how bad that gets. And we're no longer at a place where we can stop global warming. That's not on the menu. We may still be at a place where we can slow it down enough that it doesn't cut the legs out from under civilizations. That's an open question, because there's a lot of momentum in these systems. But that's why we have to try so hard right now. Other Go ahead, questions? on the other side. Hi, thanks to all of you. I'm Rachel Haverlock, an environmental humanist uh, from the UIC Freshwater Lab. Somebody said Lake Michigan, so I had to get up. Uh, so a question for each of you. We've got BP Whiting. It is the world's largest tar sand refinery. Chicago is running on the heaviest, dirtiest oil on earth. I don't blame the consumers. I uh, am with Bill that that is Team BP's problem. But just from each of your perspectives, most people don't know that we're running on tar sands. We've got a refinery that's devastated that part of coastline with a little help from the Pence brothers. Um, and we've got tremendous need to regenerate our economy and our communities with environmental industry, let's say. So how do we go from where we are, whether it's through education, redevelopment, stopping BP subsidy, how do we go from running on the world's worst oil to the direction that each of you is, um, is guiding us? Anybody want to take that first? Well, for one, we need to stop the subsidy to P, uh, to to them because the government should not be finding nobody who's, who's polluting our environment. And that's one of the biggest problems with a lot of the industry in that area because they do get subsidy from the state. But um, it's the advocacy, I mean, it's, it's a human degradation for all of us. And we need to come up with better solutions on how to deal with Sartan and how to deal with this whole uh, petroleum mess that we're in today. You know, it's unfortunately that at least BP did come up with a, a system on how to remediate the contamination on their, on their land, but they have not reached out with that technology to help the communities who has been impacted by, by um, their operation in our community. So um, it would, you know, that's what I, I was saying earlier, that it takes a, a village, an environmental village, to really, with scientists, business, community, and academia, to really come together to come up with some solution to be able to help them come up with alternative uses than using the same production facility that they use today. And if we can't change that, then they need to use the best available technology that exists on this earth in order for them to continue that operation. But that's, and then it becomes political with that, you know. We need more community lobbyists that will advocate this because believe me, the petroleum industry have their <laughs> lobbyists every day and night, a court not an elected official, and that has to change. I'd say put as many possible stories on this as possible. I mean, you know, one of the things that I have a colleague named Laura Polito at University of Oregon who's a terrific um, 
cultural geographer who works a lot on environmental justice issues and particularly environmental racism. And she's just done a, a project that's being published in the Annals of uh, Geography about Trump and spectacular racism, as she calls it. And her point is there's been this kind of spectacle of uh, a kind of renewed white nationalism calling the white nation into being a lot of the media attention on left and right goes to that. Meanwhile, 70% more in terms of actual action and policy that's been happening in the Trump administration has been about rolling back environmental regulation. So I'm not saying let's not pay attention to the racism, oh no, but let's start just focusing, focusing, focusing our media uh, attention on these kinds of events. Tar sands oil is the most, it, it is a ridiculous resource. It doesn't make any sense economically even, you know? Uh, and I think we just have to keep turning the spotlight on it. And I agree, let's not subsidize the pollute, let's not subsidize industries that are moribund, that are not part of our future. Since you said it was for all of us, I know I'm just the lowly moderator, but, um, <laughs> You know, several months ago, uh, the current mayor of the city of Chicago came out with this announcement about going uh, clean energy by, by 2050 and actually got some blowback from neighborhood organizations and environmental justice groups because there was actually no promise to do any transformation as that happened. You could totally buy wind power and solar power from just another big business conglomerate without ever doing anything to build neighborhood wealth or to empower uh, residents to use their land, use their resources, and, and do it differently. I would like to think, and I have a question after the Q&A for, for our speakers about our new mayor-elect, I would like to think that it's not just the source of the energy, but also uh, the, the power uh, of distribution, well, production, distribution, conveyance, and changing that system so that more people can benefit in more ways from that distributed energy future. Um, and I think that's what was missing in that announcement and, and needs to be paired with the shift in, in energy sources. Another right. question, Josh has yeah, one Yeah, right, right in the middle. Right in the middle. Hi, thank you all so much for being here. Um, my name is Amelia, and I'm an organizer with Rising Tide Chicago. I'm working on a divestment campaign to target Chase Bank um, to move out of tar sands. Um, and I'm wondering, we've sort of talked about this idea of creating a new public and kind of what that future can look like that's full of justice and accountability. Um, and I'm wondering if maybe each of you could talk about how do we move from this sort of individualist, consumerist, identity um, or idea that our identity comes from consumerism to this collectivism. I have a ton of friends that, you know, might not be persuaded to join protests. Um, you know, there's this weird kind of maybe sense of the loss of the individual. Um, and so when I'm just speaking about what kind of regional accountability looks like or what intergenerational accountability looks like, um, just from each of your backgrounds, how can we show up for each other? Thanks. That's a great question. Um, intergenerational accountability, um, has it been delivered? I mean, you know, it seems to me like one of the great sadnesses that I have as a teacher going to the classroom is how much all of the apparent progressive victories of the 20th century now look bankrupt to my students. Was there a civil rights movement? We're not really seeing the results of it. Was there a feminist movement? I mean, there's, there's just this sense that in so many different respects, the you know, young people have been let down and that adults don't adult. And um, I guess, you know, I would just say, I think that one thing I'm seeing from my perspective, and I think we all have very different points of view here, so very different experiences, but I'm seeing people feeling extremely um, dissatisfied with that individualism, which was such a big part of the American idea and which fed what has become an absolutely out of control super capitalism. It kind of had a, a, a way of performing itself in the 20th century, which allied with progressivism and with various rights movements, but now, in large part because of climate change, because of the kind of collective um, 
horror that we're facing as the climate really begins to shift profoundly and all kinds of people's lives are disrupted, I, I feel that people are kind of thinking, how can we find a new way? How can we find some new way of getting together? And I do think we have all kinds of movements in the Northwest, like neo-tribalism and you know, ways of, that people are kind of trying to come together, good and bad, to form collective uh, groups that really do work at smaller scales, ultimately maybe at regional scales, thinking about regional energy grids, thinking about reimagining the grid itself in a much more democratic way. Um, I, I think this, this movement um, to think about climate democracy has been one that's been profoundly about moving away from individualism and that sort of idea that the individual somehow owns property in ourselves and possibly property um, that is our own sort of little private cordoned off land base that we take care of, but that we don't actually owe anything to a common good, to common lands, to common atmosphere. The atmospheric trust litigation that I think was created by my colleague Mary C. Wood at the University of Oregon in law school, and it's become a major part of our children's trust and the various lawsuits that are in play right now. Um, you know, to, yeah, I mean, this, these are fantastic to try to protect a common atmosphere, a livable atmosphere for our children. All of these ways of thinking about commons and then thinking about decolonialized commons, that's stuff that has come into being, I think, as a result of the pressure of the physics of climate change on culture. And I feel like there's some hope in that, even though I also know and I don't know how to answer this question exactly, it's related to the last question, that we've got the Koch brothers and many others like them to contend with. First of all, many, many thanks for screwing around with Chase. They're bad guys and the biggest, uh, I was just out in Seattle the night before last with all the 350 Seattle crew who shut down 44 Chase branches last Thursday and that was, um, 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 we're in this weird moment when we have two jobs, and they're both important. Uh, one of them is to take down the existing huge fossil fuel giant superstructure quickly, and, and banks and insurance companies are an enormous part of that, along with utilities and the fossil fuel companies themselves. It's a Big, I mean, you can't build a pipeline if you can't get someone to lend you a ton of money, usually Chase, and if you can't get someone to underwrite it, and so on and so forth. Um, so that's super key work, and at the same time, we're trying to imagine how we build something new uh, uh, to take its place, something more humane. And the good news is that a certain amount of this happens not automatically, but somewhat easily as we move in the direction of renewable energy where we have to go anyway. The fact that the sun and wind are everywhere is a good thing because so much of the current imbalance of power in the world is due to the fact that small numbers of people control these small patches of ground where coal and gas and oil sit. The only reason we pay attention to the Koch brothers is not because they have some you know, great idea that they came up with about the world is because they're the biggest oil, they, they own more of the tar sands than anybody else. They're the biggest oil and gas. So they were able to purchase a political party. That's a good thing to have if you want to, you know. Um, um, the world that runs on sun and wind won't be perfect or utopian, but it'll be somewhat different and decentralized like that. Think about your community once it's got this solar array up where you're no longer shipping money out every month outside the community to pay for uh, electric bills and so on. Instead, uh, you know, uh, the utility is shipping money back in because they're buying the excess off of you. Um, so someplace in this sort of divest, invest, uh, 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 but, we, but, but as much fun as it is and it really is the most satisfying part is to work on building up one's own communities and that's easiest and it's really important work. We also have to save a little bit of energy uh, uh, on, to work on taking down the big bad superstructures because otherwise we'll have a few oases scattered in and amongst the, the wreckage, you know. Um, so it's a, it, that's why it's such a powerful moment but mostly Many thanks. Give those guys hell.
on the... So, uh, time, time in itself is a precious resource. I'm mindful of the hour and the commitment we've all made to be here. Um, Bill made reference earlier to the irresponsibility of leaving this all up to 12-year-old kids. And uh, I did see a 12-year-old kid with the other notable t-shirt of today walking across the street from my house. Uh, it said, less worrying, less hoping, more doing. Uh, and that was, that was the message on this t-shirt. And uh, so that's not a message of hope. Uh, and I don't really want to talk about hope. I want to end today with, a, with some stories of conviction. And uh, I flagged this for you before, so hopefully you're all ready, to, to share a little anecdote uh, of conviction in the, in the face of all of this and what we can all take away from that today. And we're just going to work down the line. Stephanie, tell us about conviction. Okay, well, let me say, first of all, I see conviction a lot. One of the great gifts of being a college teacher is seeing a lot of people with conviction. And I just want to give a shout out to every one of my students. Nobody's here. They're all in Oregon. But these are people who generally have conviction and are adulting. And I hate that word, by the way. It just doesn't work for me as a verb. At any rate, let me give you one example. Okay, so we do a DIY utopia project in one of my classes where I have the students create a utopia. And it has an economic system, it has an energy system, it has a gender expression or multiple gender expressions, it has a, it has a, a, a strategy to combat racism. And I had a student come up with one that was really fabulous, that involved prison reform and solar. And I'm not gonna tell you all the ways that this worked together, but it worked together really beautifully. It kind of spoke to some of the decentralization and democratization that I think Bill talks about in his book when he talks about how solar could really change uh, you know, social structures and economic structures. Um, and I just felt such admiration for this woman. And she said, you know, I don't know if I'll ever get there, but I have this blueprint and I'm just following it. And she's gonna go to law school. So her name is Lupe Partida. Kudos to you. Yeah. Cheryl? Um, what I'm going to talk about is my experience with my mom when she first started getting into this moment. But I want you to understand my mom, like, take for an example with Michael Jackson. 20, 26 years prior to his death, we was at his concert here in Chicago. He was the best babysitter I've seen in, in my life because 70% of the population was kids in the audience. 30% was adults, and the kids was obedient. None of them went to the washroom. You understand? Even my daughter at that particular time. I was like, wow, he the best babysitter in the world. So I was talking to my mom, because it was seven of us that went, because we love Michael Jackson, despite everything, his phenomenon with his music. So she said, you know what, Cheryl? She said, that boy is so great and talented that he's not going to live past the age 50. I looked at her, I said, why you say that, mama? Why are you going to say that about that? He said, because he's been to serve his, his purpose on this earth. So me and her was in Cincinnati together. We was doing some environmental training. And I was in the room, and next thing you know, they said, Michael Jackson is dead. And immediately I remember that conversation we had 26 years prior, and she said, I told you. <laughs> I was like, well, technically, he's 50 and 10 months. She said, but did he make it past 50? <laughs> you know? So to say, you know, my mother had this vision because during that particular time, she was also advocating about the change in the, winter, uh, uh, the weather pattern if we don't correct the mistakes that we're we'll doing to our air and that the, uh, the carbon emission is gonna destroy the ozone. My mother went around the country and it's all over saying the same, sending the same message. And we're gonna see a change in the weather pattern where it used to be drought, it's gonna be flooding, where it was flooding is gonna be drought. Today we call that a climate change. She called it a change in the weather pattern. So, and I'm like, for a woman who never had any science education, her highest education at that particular time was a sophomore in high school, and to hear a lot of the things that she talked about 20, 30, some, 40, 30 some years ago is happening right now today. 
is happening. Last week, y'all, we in spring, it snowed in Chicago. Something, you know, has negatively impacted. So I say this, that her vision into what is happening today, you know, I just want to be able to continue to carry her message based on the experience of what her conversation and the things she was talking about prior to her death. Thank you. Amen. Bill, conviction. Yeah, no, there's so many stories to tell, and this actually is a great year to be talking about environmental justice in general. I mean, it's 40 years ago, too, that Dr. Bullard in Houston started his work on identifying waste sites, and Dr. Beverly Wright, and so many other heroes. It's a, and such a privilege to get to just hear stories about your mom. I'll tell you one quick story about conviction that, that has a, a timely angle to it. You know, we started this fight against the Keystone Pipeline with our indigenous brothers and sisters up in Alberta basically about 10 years ago. And at the time, people said there was no chance. The oil industry had never been beaten on anything. Um, uh, in 2011, when we started big demonstrations in Washington, the National Journal, our in this sort of insider newspaper in D.C., pulled its 300 energy experts on the Hill, and 91% of them said TransCanada would have its permit by the end of 2011 to build this pipeline. Well, that was before, you know, more people went to jail than uh, about anything in this country in a very long time, 1,200 in the course of a couple of weeks, and it launched a huge campaign that so far has kept not only uh, uh, Keystone from being built, but it's expanded into people of all kinds attacking every pipeline, every coal port, every oil terminal, whatever. As you know, Donald Trump is very eager to build the Keystone Pipeline. It was the very first thing he did on his very first day in office was sign this thing. So we're back at work fighting hard yesterday afternoon in a uh, sort of late Friday afternoon news dump. The TransCanada Corporation first announced that it was changing its name to TC Energy, which is always a good sign that you're getting to them. And second, they announced that there was enough opposition that they were delaying for another year the start of construction on the Keystone Pipeline. Um, so, just a good reminder that when we fight, we win. I, I'm gonna sign books for a few minutes, but then I'm heading over to the American Indian Center because there's a big training going on uh, for people who are part of this promise to protect, to stand with those native communities and make sure that this thing never gets built if they try. Um, 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 what can we do? I mean, this is the thing of our time the most important thing to understand about climate change is the planet is now miles outside its comfort zone. What that means is it's time for us to be outside our comfort zones too in this fight. Figure out ways to go farther than you've gone so far. Thank you, Bill. We are at time. I want to thank all of you for spending your afternoon with us. Thank Bill, Cheryl, and Stephanie for being here. Have a great day. Enjoy the sunshine. There is no snow today, I am told.